90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Today, we travel to Nelson County to visit Silverback Distillery and learn what Virginia grains they use to make their spirits. Then Chris Mullins has tips on growing pumpkins from the ground up. We'll also have the Ag Calendar, a Minute in the Field video, and of course, your Ag News of the Week, all on this edition of Virginia Farming. Two thousand and sixteen has been a challenging year for Virginia's apple growers with winter heat, spring freezes, and too much late spring, early summer rain. But now that harvest has begun, the state is on track to have a good crop. Most of the Commonwealth has been dry just prior to harvest, which brings out the natural sugars for a very sweet apple. With cooler temperatures at night, a deep red color is developing in the red varieties. Virginia apples may be a little smaller this year, but the supply should be plentiful at the fruit stands and in the stores. The Commonwealth is the seventh largest U.S. apple growing state, home to more than 150 commercial apple growers. In 2014, apples were Virginia's 15th largest agricultural commodity, with farm cash receipts totaling $37 million. Fluctuation in milk prices is something Virginia dairy farmers have always endured. But the latest downswing has seen milk checks shrink by 35 percent the past two years, with little improvement in sight. Worldwide, consumers are drinking less milk, and that lack of demand is causing dairy farmers around the world to suffer. That's why some dairy farmers welcomed news that the USDA is purchasing 11 million pounds of excess cheese from private sources for use in food banks across the nation, thus removing excess milk supplies from the marketplace. Experts hope this will help keep family farmers in business. Last year, more than 1,200 dairy farms went out of business across the nation. A more long-term source of aid for some dairy farmers is the USDA's Dairy Margin Protection Program. It's only been in effect since 2014, and farmer enrollment in the program has been slow. The USDA has extended the Margin Protection Program registration date for this year to December 16th. Well, caring for the land and the animals, it's not just something that farmers say. In this segment, a Kansas family shares why sustainability matters to them. Bob Severa reports. The Jaeger family knows that without optimum health in all aspects of their operation, there is no sustainability. And they want people outside agriculture to know it too. We think it's important to have transparency of what we're doing and how we're producing the product that we're producing to the consumer. And uh, we believe that it's imperative to handle our livestock in a low stress environment and to follow all the protocols and guidelines that are set out by the Beef Quality Assurance. Studies show that two of the Jaeger's operational goals are closely related, producing the best beef and low stress cattle handling. When you want high quality beef, uh, that includes taking really great care of your cattle and really great care of the land that you're on. And so it all works together and that's the word kind of holistic, uh, I think really defines uh, what we're looking for. That means looking at the entire business, from genetics and marketing to animal and soil health. They've made improvements with a comprehensive grazing plan the last two years. That's our future. Uh, you know, agriculture as a whole's future is, is soil health. It's just incredibly important, especially during a drought. But that's, that's where our focus is, is really on, on soil health and, and getting our organic matter up and, and all of those things that are going to be good for the long term. Quality. It's a whole systems approach that the Jaegers are looking to master. I'm Bob Cervera. Thanks, Bob. 
Seven years ago, the local food hub was created to bring more locally grown food to the people of Central Virginia. Starting with a network of 10 growers and one delivery truck, Local Food Hub now has more than 60 small family farms and 200 customers across Virginia and into D.C. and Maryland. Thousands of Virginia farmers raise local produce and meats, and most of them sell to the public through farmers markets, directly to restaurants, or use the community-supported agriculture business model, where customers buy a share of the produce raised each year. Larger customers, like hospitals and schools, need daily deliveries of fresh food all year long. And until the local food hub, there wasn't an efficient method of getting local foods to those customers. The food hub works by aggregating supplies from a number of local growers to create its own regional food system. It offers fresh fruits and vegetables, frozen meats and poultry, eggs, and more to its clients. Farmers who participate receive an average of 80 cents of each dollar. The hub also purchases products outright and assumes responsibility for liability, traceability, marketing, and sales, allowing the growers to focus on raising food. The organization offers training for new growers, and they're always looking for new opportunities to improve the availability of local foods to consumers. More information can be found at the web address on your screen. Because of the Food Hub's efforts, the University of Virginia is offering a 100% local foods option to diners this fall. Well, distilling spirits dates far back into Virginia's rich history. One family has started their own business, Silverback Distillery in Afton. Even though their products are receiving rave reviews internationally, it hasn't been an easy undertaking. We'll find out why straight ahead on Ag Insights. Today we're in Nelson County and we're visiting Silverback Distillery. I'm joined by CEO and distiller, Christine Riggleman. Christine, thank you so much for having us out today. You're welcome. This is a beautiful place. Thank you. So, how long has Silverback been here? We've been open for a year and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. Since August of 2014. And I have to ask about the name. Where, <laughs> where, where did you get the name Silverback from? I think that's one of the first questions most customers ask. Um, so, my husband and I both own this together. Um, it was my uh, baby and uh, my brainchild of what I wanted to do, but my husband has been wonderful and gone along with almost every idea I had. And so, we have three daughters and me, and so four females in the house sort of outnumber him all the time. And um, his nickname is Silverback because it was either go gray or go bald with that many females in the house. Um, so that's the story because he's been wonderful and supported me with what I wanted to do. So I wanted to, as a tribute, name it after him. So, so you said this is something you've always wanted to do. What made you decide, hey, let's start a distillery? Well, basically, we, we bought the property for our, for our home. We live on it. But I also wanted to do a business on the front with whatever property I, uh, we purchased. And um, the road frontage, the, the visibility here was amazing. The, the traffic, and this is a tourist destination. You know, people want to get away for the weekend. And it's a wonderful location, but I, I wanted to make sure that after we bought it, that I watched and observed. I, I didn't want to oversaturate the market because we have a 14 mile stretch along Route 151 here in <laughs> Afton, and it's seven wineries, three breweries, two hard cider places now, and there was no distillery. And I was always fascinated with spirits and liquor, and um, honestly, I'm not a beer or wine person. I drink a little bit, but I, I've always liked spirits, so I wanted to make something that I felt comfortable with and I enjoyed, so. I went and apprenticed out west, and I learned the foundations, and then I had a couple master distillers as consultants that my husband and I hired and uh, just went from there. Okay. Now, what spirits do you all distill here? So we've got our vodka. It's called Berenge Vodka. Berenge is a scientific term for gorilla. So it's got a silverback coming through the back of the glass there. And then we've got our gin. Our gin is called Strange Monkey Gin. And then this is our um, blackback white. So all the young male gorillas that surround a silverback are called blackbacks. I want to talk about the spirits themselves. Sure. So starting with the vodka, what is your vodka made from? It's 100% wheat. So I researched every ingredient that I thought I wanted to use. And um, little, you know, things I figured out along the way. And um, I don't go too, the main ingredient in gin is juniper. Okay. And so I don't go too, too, too heavy on it. You do have mm -hmm. to have it as a main ingredient. But we also balanced it with citrus. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a nice flavor profile. And then we um, do a London dry gin. So we don't, some people um, basically take all your botanicals and they just sort of steep it in your base, which is like usually your vodka. So our base is 
for our gin is our vodka. Okay. Everything is grown right here. and distilled here. Yes, and then all of our spent mash. So when we're done distilling, um, it's called spent mash. So it's mm -hmm. all the leftover grains. Um, there's actually no alcohol content in it, but it still has the flavor of it. So the animals love it. So um, we give it to our local farmers. Um, the, they use it for their fertilizer, they use it for the cows, they use it for pigs. So we're giving back to the farmers as well. And that really eliminates almost all of your waste. Yes, and we're the first distillery in the country to use geothermal technology for our chilling process. So um, at least that we know of. I mean, I Googled the heck out of, you know, um, seeing if there was anybody else out there. But a lot of distilleries have popped up since us and are modeling after what we have done. So it helps us in our chilling process. We use the Earth's natural temperatures to chill at certain parts of our processes that we need. And so we're okay. not taking huge heavy equipment and it cuts down our, our, our expenses for our electric and everything. So right. but it's very environmentally safe. Well, I am not very schooled on the distilling process at all. <laughs> so can you take can you walk me through the process of, for example, uh, how you start from start to finish to get your bottle of vodka? So what you do is you start in a mash cooker. And a mash cooker it has coils inside of it and you, we feed it with live steam and then we fill the coils up with water to certain levels and then we add our grains at different points and different things and okay. and all know, according to your recipe yeah, according to my recipe and then basically when we're done with that they sit in fermenters and the fermenters um, some people have a closed top fermenter some people have open fermenters some people have wood some people have metal there's so many different choices to get you a different end result with each one and basically they sit in the fermenters anywhere from three to five to seven days depending on the temperatures that you have in the back and then okay. as it's doing that it's converting over so all the the yeast is converting everything over and you, you know you're starting to make alcohol so basically when it's ready we put it through the still pump it through the still and it strips away all the grains you have the mash that comes out we give it to the farmers and then you know the good product comes out and we have the alcohol i can turn these around um, between start, you know, cooking it to being in the bottle in uh, about seven days. Wow. Yeah. So now let's go back and visit the whiskey and bourbon side. Mm -hmm. What's your turnaround time and what's that process like? So um, basically when we're done distilling, it'll either be bottled into a clear, you know, depending on what recipe we're doing or it goes into a barrel to age. So the whiskey, we're going to age a minimum of two years and then the bourbon a minimum of three. So, and okay. then we'll go longer with some, and then we'll do some fun stuff. So. Okay. Is, is this uh, all family-run business? Yeah, so my husband and I own this together. Um, he had his own um, Department of Defense company, and he recently separated from that, and so now he's on board full-time, so we have the resident Silverback around, and um, so that's wonderful. But um, our oldest daughter graduated from EVA in the spring, and she's our general manager. She's been with us since the beginning, and she's going to Scotland. She just got accepted to go to get her master's degree in fermentation and distillation to help mama make the hooch. Our middle daughter, she does all of our documentaries and films and all that kind of stuff, and our youngest helps fill in whenever possible. So it's very much family run and very close uh, team we have. We have about anywhere between 12 and 15 employees, depending on the season. So um, okay. we call them our troop. You know, um, when gorillas and primates have a family, they call it a troop, and we call our employees troop ambassadors because they're like our family. So it's pretty awesome. It, it, it's a great company. It sounds like everybody here has a great time working together. Yeah. And it is family. Yeah, it is. Well, speaking of family, we're going to go find <laughs> your silver back here Sounds and talk good. to him for a little bit. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. So we've caught up with Denver Riggleman. Denver is the old silverback from what your wife tells us. You're, you're the reason that this company is named what it is. Sadly, and, and uh, you know, I got gray hair pretty early and I was a bit huskier too. So I was about 60 pounds heavier about a year ago. So, uh, so I had to you know, lose a little bit of weight in order to live a little bit longer on this earth. So I'm more of the, the thin back now. It's more than the silver back. I so wanted to talk a little bit about um, about distilleries in general. Now, Virginia distilleries are governed by ABC. ABC. Yep. So how does yep. that work? Well, we're a little bit different from beer, wine, and cider in that um, we're in the three-tier system probably a little bit more than anybody because um, actually Virginia controls our distribution. So they control how many stores we're in, they control our distribution, they control our retail price points, they control how much we can serve in a distillery. 
Uh, they control every single aspect of our business. So it really behooves us to be pretty friendly with the ABC, right. despite, the, despite the restrictions. But those are not the same restrictions that are on that beer is, and wine. That is absolutely correct. And, you know, and, and right now we're trying to change some of those laws and issues. ABC is tough on us, but they have to be. You know, where they can be supportive, they've been very supportive. Uh, but it's the legislature, actually, in Richmond that determines what ABC can or can't do. And right now we're fighting uh, that very legislature and the other alcohol industries because they're not real happy that we're trying to liberalize like they are. I think the biggest surprise for us and what we've been going through is how virulent the opposition has been from beer and wine lobbies against us. Uh, and and we're, we're going through that every day. Now, ABC has liberalized some of those things based on what the legislature allows them to do. It's really up to the legislature to tell ABC what laws to enforce and, and what, we're, what we're allowed to do now. I think when you're looking at the surrounding states, how they're liberalizing, we've actually had states contact us, Amy, to ask to move this distillery based just on our sales to their states and they would help us move. And that, that really stings us uh, because um, we're so small in the grand scheme of things. What did ABC do last year? $800 million in tax revenue. <laughs> um, all the distilleries in Virginia did about $5 million total. And that's just, that's gross sales. That's not profit for us. That's not profit for ABC. Right. We're that small. And we're at the mercy of the big liquor producers because we actually make our own stuff rather than trucking stuff in from other states or trucking stuff in from actual chemical sure. factories. We actually make it. I know that sounds crazy with Virginia grains and water. <laughs> uh, so we're at a disadvantage there. We're at a disadvantage with the beer and wine lobbies who don't want us to have the same laws that they have where they can freely sell at events. They actually get to keep the retail price of their bottle. They only have to pay taxes on sales out of their actual locations. We don't have any of those. those so you times. can't keep the retail price Oh, on your not. on your bottle. So how does that work? So what happens is we sell you a bottle for twenty nine dollars and eighty nine cents. For that twenty nine dollars and eighty nine cents, you also pay tax on it five point three percent. So you pay thirty one dollars and forty seven cents for that bottle from our distillery and from an ABC store. Okay. I hate to tell our gross price, but our gross price is only forty five percent of that our wholesale price. ABC takes fifty five percent of that, which doesn't count our federal taxes either, which is another six percent on federal taxes. So each one of our bottles... So now you're down to 30% or less. 30% or less. And we have to pay all of our labor, all of our bottle prices, all of our, our, you know, our cost of goods sold, so everything that we have, all of that comes out of that 30% on a bottle. Now what's even better, which should make you very happy, ABC does get all those taxes. Uh, however, their profit we actually saw on the bottle, even after their taxes, about $9.85 per bottle. Our net profit on our vodka and gin, which are internationally award-winning liquors, is about $1.50 per bottle. So that's what we're fighting. We're actually sitting in your tasting room right now. That's right. So what can visitors expect when they come to your tasting room? Well, they can expect probably more fun than you're allowed to have by law with two <laughs> ounces of liquor. Um, what they can expect is an education on our liquor. They can expect the fact they can watch it being made right here. Um, you know, right back there in that uh, distillery, they can watch through the window. There's even days on Saturdays we might be bottling, we might be making liquor, we might be blending, we might be taking in grains. And people are absolutely just, just, uh, they're in awe that they get to see that because we're completely transparent here. Not only that, all of the people that work for us, and they're mostly college students because they're smarter than me, and, and, but, um, <laughs> But most of them that are here, actually, we take them through the whole process and teach them how to distill. So they're behind the bars actually giving you the lowdown, how our liquor is made, what it's going to taste like, what you compare it to. So we have craft mixers and we have okay. tastings that they can come in and they can get, you know, so many different types of drinks. You know, our strange monkey signature cocktail. They can get a Cape Cod with our Barangay vodka. They can get the Alpha Elixir, which is blackberries, ginger in our vodka. Wow, so there's all that sounds amazing. It is amazing, and uh, we present it with fun, we present it with flair, uh, and we present it in a way that they know it's craft, and it's actually grain to glass, 100% Virginia grains, water from our property, and we're, we're blasting music and playing movies and having a great time. Sounds like fun. It's a lot of fun. So if any of our viewers are interested in, in purchasing any Silverback products, they can come here. They can. Or where else? Liquor stores yes. around the state? Around the state. We're in 140 out of 350 ABC stores now. Okay. But by law, and that's where ABC is helpful, if you go in and ask for a bottle at any liquor store, uh, they have to get it for you. Uh, that's what they have to do in an ABC store. So that's very helpful for us. And, okay. and again, you know, where ABC can support us, they've been fantastic. And, and so that's one thing that you can do. Also, you can get it online. Now, we have to ship to D.C. 
so that you can actually get it online because <laughs> Virginia doesn't allow shipping of their liquor either. Okay. But ac we actually ship to D.C. and then D.C. you can actually go online, hook up to it with our D.C. stores and actually get our liquor delivered to your door. And can, can people do that through your website? They can do that through our website. And what is your website? Our website is www.sb for silverback distillery.com. Sbdistillery.com. Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank Denver, you. thank you so much for having us out today. Thank you so it is much. it's been a pleasure. Thanks. I've learned a lot about distilling and spirits and everything. Well now I think after the camera's off, all is left to do is for you to drink. I Shh. think. Oh, and I will. I'll be quiet about that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. It's that time of year when pumpkins are everywhere. Have you ever thought about growing your own? Chris Mullins has tips on growing pumpkins from the ground up. Hello, today we're at College Run Farm in Surrey, Virginia, and we're here with Steve Berryman, the owner and farmer. He grows a lot of pumpkins, as you see behind me. How many acres do you have, Steve? This year we have about eight and a half acres of pumpkins. That's a lot of pumpkins. Uh, they really take up a lot of space, as I can see here. Um, as we're thinking about the home gardener and them growing pumpkins and gourds in the home garden, what kind of spacing would they need to put out a pumpkin like this right here? For your larger pumpkins, like the one you're holding, uh, they require about 25 square feet per plant. So, you know, if you're planting in rows, five feet between rows and five feet spacing uh, between seeds in the row. Okay. If, if the home gardener's thinking about putting pumpkins out, how long a season does it take? When, when should they start putting their seed or transplanting in the ground, and when do they think about harvesting? Well, if, if you want to harvest a pumpkin like this for, uh, for Halloween, say, uh, you probably want to plant around July the 1st. If you're looking for something more decorative to start in September, you may back that up and plant a little bit earlier. But generally, the last week in June or the first week in July. They want that warm soil, right? Warm soil. Uh, you want a well-drained soil, um, something that doesn't hold water, because uh, pumpkins just don't like to get their feet wet. But you do, they do need some irrigation or some watering. If it does get dry, you will need to irrigate, and you're better to irrigate under the plants, uh, just, just the soil, because uh, the more the plants get wet, the more they may harbor some uh, disease also. Well, Steve, uh, we looked at the normal kind of pumpkin over there, and we're seeing all kinds of different shapes and sizes of the pumpkins and gourds here. Tell us a little bit about some of the things we're seeing. Well, we do have pumpkins and gourds and some squash here. Uh, this is a swan gourd. This is good for uh, drying out and decorating later on. Uh, we've got some munchkin pumpkins. Um, these are real easy to grow and they produce a lot on the vine. Squash, um, this is aluminum pumpkin. It's white on the outside, um, orange flesh on the inside. It's good for cooking. Uh, the warty ones are getting real popular uh, with, with folks. So we've, we've just got a lot of variety. Now, are some of these um, edible at all? Oh yeah, um, a lot of these can be used as decorations in the fall and then when you finish with them for decorating they can be taken to your kitchen, uh, made into pies or pumpkin butter. Uh, you can bake some of these squash, uh, very tasty. Um, so sure, a lot, a lot of them are edible. Uh, the gourds generally are not edible, but most of your pumpkins and, and squash are. Well now, uh, there's so many different types, so many different seed types. Can the home gardeners find these seeds online or in catalogs for sure, all these different things? There are a lot of uh, seed companies that not only offer them to commercial growers, but they have websites where you can go in and just buy a few seeds of each if that's all you need. A lot of different choices. A lot of choices. <laughs> Hundreds of choices. Well, great. Well, for more information about gourds and pumpkins, please contact your local county extension office. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. Pumpkin season and oyster season go hand in hand, so oyster festivals are plentiful this time of year. Taking a look at the Ag calendar, Saturday, October 8th is the Oyster Festival at Tom's Cove in Chincoteague. And Friday and Saturday, November 4th and 5th, is the 60th anniversary of the official Oyster Festival of the Commonwealth in Urbana. Both festivals will offer food and fun for everyone. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. 